Okay, this will be the last um, video clip relating to the alchemist. And at this point in the play, by the time that we're at the end of Act 3, what Johnson is going to do, and, uh, as he does in Volpone and as he will do in Bartholomew Fair, are simply work out the comic complications that he uh, has set up in his plot so far. And what we get in this part of the play really is a lot of fun, uh, a lot of slapstick comedy, a lot of farce, not a whole lot of thematic content anymore at this point uh, until perhaps we get to the very end. So what happens? Let's just take a look at some of the plot twists that Johnson is able to pull off. First, we have the uh, assignation of Dahl Common and um, Sir Epicure Mammon. And uh, Johnson has set up a plot. He's got the gun cocked because we know that Dahl is mad and that she's gone mad from reading the words of Broughton and that no one is to say to her or mention to her anything having to do with theology. This is Johnson's comment on the theological insanity of the time that he lives in and how people can go off. They could go off on this kind of thing today or on politics today. If you press the right button on somebody, just stand back. So um, Sir Epicure obviously is going to press the wrong button. He's going to say something that can somehow be taken uh, as a theological reference by Dahl. And off she goes into the most incredible nonsense. You'll get to one speech in the play where we have uh, several characters talking at the same time. Now this is a very convenient uh, little plot device that Subtle and Face have cooked up because only pure people can acquire the Philosopher's Stone. And in attempting to seduce Dahl, this poor helpless noble woman, um, Sir Epicure has violated the rules of purity that would allow anyone to get the Philosopher's Stone. And what happens, according to Subtle's tale, boom, up goes the whole alchemical apparatus uh, in a big explosion, and um, all of their work to acquire the Philosopher's Stone has gone for nothing because of uh, Sir Epicure's moral lapse. So this is one of the funny moments of the play. Um, the other one, of course, that we've been waiting, other bomb we've been waiting to go off, is Surly. Surly described as a Spaniard trying to get into this household, um, find out what is going on, and then rat everybody out. Um, but then Surly uh, also picks up another objective, and that is Dame Pliant, this gorgeous 19-year-old uh, with a huge dowry, and he wants to marry her. Uh, both for herself and for her dowry. Um, but he doesn't get a chance. He doesn't get a chance to do this. First, Subtle comes in and he sees him. Uh, and Surly reveals himself to Subtle and he starts beating Subtle. And I think that this should go on for quite a while on stage. Uh, a lot of running around, a lot of Subtle trying to get away so that um, we can have a great scene when Face comes in to rescue him. And how does Face do this? Well, Face uses improv, uh, improvisational drama, as they have supplied Dame Pliant uh, when they need an extra woman. Face makes use of Castrol, and he says, ah, this guy's here to practice quarreling with you, Castrol, because Castrol's trying to learn how to challenge people to duels. Quarrel with him. So Castrol starts to quarrel with him, and uh, Surly is... Um, forced to divert his attention to Castrol. And of course, Castrol is someone who Surly has to make friends with uh, because he wants to marry Surly's sister, and Surly really would have to um, agree to that. Uh, excuse me, not Surly, but Castrol would have to agree to that because Castrol now is the main man in his sister's life. Uh, he would He's functioning as a father toward her at this point, not a very good one. Um, so that definitely distracts Sir Epicure for a while. And then uh, after that, if, uh, chaos goes on. Um, in comes uh, Abel Drugger, who charges um, Surly with a whole bunch of f claims. Uh, he, he says, Surly has run up all these charges at my store and he hasn't paid for them, so he starts arguing with Surly about that. This is untrue. 
Drugger knows it's untrue, but uh, he's got a rival for Dame Pliant's hand, and um, so Face has put him up to this. So he starts arguing as well with Surly. Amidst all this chaos, in comes Ananias, and I think he gets one of the funniest moments of the play. He says, peace be to this house, and it's it's anything but pe peaceful. And Ananias recognizes Surly as a Spaniard. He's still dressed as a Spaniard. Ananias hates anything Catholic, hates Spaniards. And Ananias starts tearing into Surly. So we've got three people on Surly uh, distracting him so that Subtle is able to uh, sneak off and... Uh, Face really has the last laugh on Surly. Surly finally is made to exit the house. At this point, when things can't seem to get any more chaotic, when we expect the um, police or neighborhood watch to show up or, or whatever, um, after Surly is ejected, uh, we expect Surly to tell Sir Epicure Mammon about all of this. Back comes Lovewit. Uh, the master of the house, Jeremy's employer, earlier than Jeremy ever expected. Again, something else that was promised. What we get are just a whole bunch of comic situations that could be used in a show like I Love Lucy. Um, and, of course, the neighbors come around and they say, we've been seeing all these people coming in and out of the house. But the most important thing that happens in this series of events is that as Jeremy is trying to lie his way out of it, all of a sudden we hear Dapper, who I think and just any audience would have forgotten about at this point, crying uh, from the privy. He's finally eaten through all the gingerbread, and perhaps his gag has, has slipped down. And uh, at that point, Lovewood looks at Jeremy, uh, who is, we suppose, perhaps the real name for Face, uh, who has you know, allowed Subtle and Dahl to use the the house of uh, Lovewood for all of these swindles. Lovewood looks at Jeremy and says, okay, come on, you know I'm a pretty lenient guy and I don't mind a little larceny. Why don't you just tell me what's going on? So Jeremy has to con confess and they come up with a kind of compromise themselves. They become allies. And uh, it's going to turn out, of course, that, that Lovewit is going to be the one who gets Dame Pliant. His wife has died. Now he's going to acquire a, a different one, a younger one. And, you know, multiple marriages were quite frequent uh, in the Renaissance because of high mortality rates, especially high mortality rates among women who uh, really were put in danger by childbirth. Uh, Lovewit's going to acquire Dame Pliant, her dowry, and plus almost all the booty whatever split he and Jeremy have worked out that um, the three con men have been able to gather and that is sitting in the basement of his house. So if we go back to the play, we remember that it starts with a big conflict between Subtle and Face that Dal Common comes in to uh, settle so that they can all rob together in peaceful harmony. Well, that's always a very tenuous alliance, especially between face and, and subtle, and we see tension there in uh, the contest over who's going to get Dame Pliant. Uh, and we find out at the end that uh, Dahl and Subtle are far more closer to each other than they are to face, and they're both tired of him, and they both decide to cheat face and take everything. Uh, they are unable to do that, but they are able to get away at the end, scot-free, although with, with none of the gains of their, their thieving. So the one point I think that we could end this play with, uh, that is a major thematic point in the work of Johnson, uh, both in this play and in Bartholomew Fair and in a lot of his poetry, is that we shouldn't expect too much from human nature and we shouldn't really self-righteously want to punish it. Um, Johnson does not punish the villains in either um, The Alchemist or in Bartholomew Fair. Uh, they do get punished in Volpone. Their characters very like uh, the ones that we see in The Alchemist. Uh, Volpone and Mosca are quite a bit like Subtle and Face. Uh, but Johnson seems to be 
saying in his um, plays that we should have a more easygoing attitude toward human sin. And it's, it's skullduggery, uh, fraud, you know, whatever. Johnson presents it just as a part of, of London life. And to be a Londoner, you have to get used to the environment that you're living in, and there's no sense getting too worked up about it. Johnson's main target in this play and in The Alchemist are the Puritans who want life to be better than Johnson thinks that it can be. And although by the time he's written this play, Johnson has gone from the Catholic Church back to being a member of the Church of England, Johnson's attitude is a kind of easygoing Catholic attitude toward human weakness. Uh, something that can be forgiven, something that ought to be forgiven if you're going to have a happy life. Uh, I think finally, perhaps the one representative of his viewpoint is Lovewood, the opportunist who you know, tells Jeremy, you know, I like a good laugh. Just tell me what's going on. You don't have to worry about anything. And it's that attitude at the end of the play uh, that is finally rewarded. Um, all these people are working, striving to get what they want. Epicure uh, striving to achieve his impossible dreams. Uh, he's punished a little bit. Um, Everybody is punished a little bit by the failure of that, but the one person who's not published is uh, punished is the person who's not striving. He just everything falls into Lovewood's lap. Um, I think that's part of Johnson's message. Johnson's message is just don't take things too seriously. Uh, it's a good message for a satire, a good message for a farce, and that's how this play ends. So for the next play that we look at by Johnson. Uh, Bartholomew Fair, we'll see what kind of variations uh, that he runs on this theme.